Welcome to the show, everybody. My name is Mark Farzetta. This is the Farzy Show, presented by MyBookie, MyBookie.ag. Lovely to have you along for the ride. Uh, definitely on dealer time for the live audience today. Uh, my apologies. Uh, having trouble uh, having some things load before the show. So here I am. Miss Koozie. I have to rec- recant something I said on last night's postgame show, which uh, was uh, really lashing out a little bit about uh, Rob Thompson. And I, I didn't hear what he had to say after the game about Spencer Turnbull, but it, it's still the, I, the the philosophy behind pulling a pitcher who was cruising through six scoreless innings and only 82, 83 pitches last night, that's something that just really, it grinds my gears, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It just really grinds my gears when I see a starting pitcher being pulled from the game who is cruising, dealing, unhittable virtually the way Spencer Turnbull was last night against the St. Louis Cardinals. And after the game, it turns out that either he told Rob Thompson that he was just exhausted or Rob Thompson just got the feeling that he was exhausted. He was asked afterwards, Rob Thompson, about whether or not he was going to give Spencer Turnbull one more inning. And the reason that's relevant is because, regardless of how you look at it, the bullpen blew the game last night. The bullpen has been great for the most part this year. Um. But last night was not an example of that. The minute he took out Spencer Turnbull, you see the home run given up to Herrera by Sir Anthony Dominguez. Then you see Jose Alvarado have to come in and pitch a little earlier than he was supposed to. He doesn't end up closing the game. Jeff Hoffman comes in to close the game. Jeff Hoffman ends up blowing the game but still getting the win. And then, thank goodness, the daycare kids were uh, all about playing yesterday. And Alec Bohm came up with a big hit there in the 10th inning, uh, an RBI double to get the Phillies the lead back. And then you had Bryson Stott step up with an RBI sack fly uh, to get the, catch you the insurance run. All that was great. But possibly not necessary if you had Spencer Turnbull go one more inning. In this day and age, like, we always talk about whether or not a pitcher is going to, oh, Kenny, you know, can he go you know, 100 pitches? You know, can he go seven innings? Can he have a complete game? Those incredible things. Complete games. What? I, I think we're going to get to a point in baseball where there may be more no-hitters than complete games. If that hasn't already, I don't even know. I don't even know if it's already happened. Um, but what we're never going to see is a is a manager go no 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 you got one more in you like that's never gonna if, the, if a pitcher's like yeah my arms kind of feel a little tired a little tired oh my god give him a week off you know you're gonna skip a start whatever uh, but regardless of how long he pitched when Spencer Turnbull was in the game for those six innings and I do know it was a very generous strike zone for the first really five six innings of the game last night. And Spencer Turnbull goes out there again, and he is fantastic. Pitches that he had diving out of the zone that were unhittable. Guys were just flailing at through last night's game. And you could, yes, attribute that to the umpire. See, this one's so difficult about the way they do balls and strikes in baseball, and I know that's the way it's always been done. But it's like I want to give Spencer Turnbull all the credit in the world, but damn, that strike zone was pretty fat, okay? And then – by the seventh inning, eighth inning, ninth inning, it went on like Weight Watchers or something. It started shrinking just a little bit more. Uh, but hey, look, the numbers are the numbers. You can't argue with the numbers. The numbers are pretty damn good for Spencer Turnbull. 11 scoreless innings to start his Phillies career is pretty amazing. And I did not expect to get this guy. And one of the things they did ask Rob Thompson about after the game was basically, where did you find him? Dealing with injury issues, had been getting rocked. Well, how, well, why now was Spencer Turnbull? And they said they had a scout go out. They looked at him and was like, yeah, he's healthy. He's ready to go. Have, bring him in. And they brought him in. Yesterday, before the start, Spencer Turnbull, of course, um, coming off a of one hell of a debut, five scoreless, goes into last night's game. And just before the game, news comes out about Taiwan Walker. The man Turnbull is, of course, taking the spot of in the rotation right now. Supposed to be just holding down the fort. Well, he's doing more than holding down the fort, Spencer Turnbull. What he's doing is being dominant. And Taiwan Walker is going to start his rehab assignment Thursday night. And they're going to set him at a pitch count. And then after that, he's supposed to have three more starts. So four starts in total. 
and they're going to ramp up his pitch count 15 pitches each time, according to Scott Lobber of Inquire.com. And every time they do that, they're going to just start kicking, kicking it up, kicking it up, kicking it up for him to see how he does before he comes back to the big leagues. There is no way that he joins the rotation. At, well, we'll see where we're at, of course, in four or five days and all that stuff. But there are four or five starts. There's no way that he is kicking Spencer Turnbull out of the rotation right now. Now, maybe look, maybe there's some clock waiting to strike midnight and the pumpkin is getting ready to turn back into a pumpkin and not be a carriage anymore and all that. But it, barring that, as long as this man is cruel, as long as this man is not allowed a run, then you don't, you know, there's no, there's no tinkering. Not even on my mind yet. So when we talk about uh, Taiwan Walker coming back to join the Phillies, uh, the rotation, eh, not so fast. The bullpen, long relief, keep him stretched out. Then yes, then maybe that's where Taiwan Walker will go because you're not taking Spencer Turnbull out of the rotation when he hasn't allowed a run through his first 11 innings. Let's just see, you know, let's see how long this streak goes. Let's see how long uh, that goes. <clears throat> Watching last night's game. First off, still frustrated at the fact that the Phillies couldn't get a big hit from one of their regulars in the last game against the Nationals to just lock up that sweep. That would have been a nice that would have been a nice thing, right? Yeah, sure. Win the series, which they could do today. Also, Phillies could. They could win their second consecutive series with a victory today, which would be nice. You got Zach Wheeler on the hill. Let's go. Uh, but watching it, I just wanted. I needed a I needed a feel good story, and the feel good story for me, and I think for most people, was watching Johan Rojas play. Did his job in center field, nice diving catch, uh, was tracking down line drives, and everything was great. And we we expect that from Johan Rojas in center field. But last night in the batter's box, he puts in a three hit night and caps it off by showing off his speed uh, with a didn't field single. Just barely beating out, beating it out. It was fan, it was great to watch him play last night. Yes, I, I think they even made the point during the broadcast. He looked like he was swinging with great aggression through the strike zone. He did not look timid. He did not look scared. Sometimes guys just might need that step away for a day, that day off, clear their head, kind of mentally hit the reset button. And Johan Rojas got that opportunity with the last game in D.C., Gave him the day off. He came back out this time around, and for whatever reason, he just hits really well in St. Louis, and he hit well in St. Louis again. He got the Phillies on the board with an RBI single in the fifth inning, uh, making one nothing. That was great to see him do that. Again, just confident through the zone, and that was a big inning in general because you had three hits in a row. You had Marsh with a single. You had Stubbs with a single. Oh, Stubbs playing last night, and then you had Johan Rojas come up there with the RBI single to get the Phillies on the board, which was fantastic. It was great. Um, the more you get from this, and I, I was funny because I was looking at the lineup last night. And after the game, I was looking at the, the box score. And what was, one of the things that was funny was before the season, we were all talking about how, oh, if you need Yo if you need Johan Rojas to hit, then you got bigger problems than Johan Rojas. And last night was a perfect example of Johan Rojas hitting and virtually nobody else hitting. Okay, you had Marsh hit a home run. That was great. His third of the season. That was an insurance run. Turned out to be huge. And then uh, you had, uh, before that, uh, you had the three-hit game from uh, Trey Turner, which was great. Uh, two infield singles, by the way. Three infield singles in total for the Phils. Seemed like there was a lot last night. Uh, but Trey Turner did hit, got the three infield singles. But looking down the lineup, you're looking for guys to get you that big hit, the, the hit that matters. And Johan Rojas essentially got you three of those. Trey Turner, of course. Uh, he got an RBI single as well. Um, but you're looking at guys like Castellanos. Harper got intentionally walked in the 10th inning. Um, Kyle Schwarber, 0 for 5 last night. Like, you're looking for other guys that you can rely on for those big hits. And the guy that came up with it last night was Johan Ross. The guy that came up with it in 10 innings in the 10th inning was Alec Bow. But just put a bow on Rojas. Uh, they're interviewing him after the game, and he just talked about how comfortable he is in St. Louis, uh, how he just sees the ball well for whatever reason in St. Louis, and kind of the the weight off his shoulders by having a night like he had last night. 
baseball is such a funny game when it comes to, like I think sports in general are a funny game when it comes to confidence, but baseball there's so much of it that's just mental uh that you have to be so focused when you make that you know, what is it tenth of a second decision, two tenths of a second decision to swing at a baseball or not. You can't have a lot going on clouding your focus, clouding your judgment in that instance. So I think getting the day off of Yon Rojas, let him let him reset things a little bit so he could go out there and swing the way he did yesterday. So you build off it today. You build off it today. That's the goal. I was uh I got into this last night as well. I'm gonna get into it again. I, I'm really rooting for Brandon Marsh here. I, thinking about Brandon Marsh and the fact that he hit his third home run of the season last night, he's played so well in left field, almost robbed that home run from Herrera to save Sir Anthony Dominguez when he came in in that seventh inning. Almost robbed that home run off the tip of his mitt. Third home run last night as well. I'd love to see Brandon Marsh flirt with an all-star appearance. I'd love to see Brandon Marsh flirt with a gold glove. Like, be in that conversation by the time the all-star votes really start kicking around, right? Uh, be there in the conversation at the end of the season for maybe winning that gold glove. I'd love to see that. You could get it with Johan Rojas. You could get it with Brandon Marsh because he's that good. When I think about the guy that the Phillies traded for, if you remember, you're talking about Mickey Moniak and Noah Syndergaard, and you were talking about Logan O'Hoppy and Brandon Marsh. If, I was like, hold on, Logan O'Hoppy, you don't, you don't trade him for like Rodone at the time? Uh, like, come on. You can get a little bit, you can, you can add him to get a bigger arm in this rotation. Like Brandon Marsh, another defensive center fielder? What is going on? And. He was hitting like 220 at the time. The, the, the talk was always about change of scenery. Can the Phillies crack the code? The Phillies see something in his swing that they can fix with Kevin Long, and they just get their hands on him. They can make something happen. Now, last, last year, he started out fantastic. Came down to earth a little bit. Still struggled with left-handed pitching. Uh, hit 229 against lefties last year. Um, but they seem to have cracked a code with Brandon Marsh to really reach him. Part of that might also be maturity, just getting older, getting more experience. But the other part of it is coaching and coaching him up. And what I have seen from Brandon Marsh is a guy that can absolutely flirt with being an all-star. He could be in the conversation for gold glove, and that's something that you knew before he was even here. And he can obviously run the bases. And this is a guy that I, I talk about a lot, guys that don't shy away from the moment. This guy embraces a moment. And that's one of the things that I really like about Brandon Marsh since he's come to Philadelphia is he definitely embraces the moment. And you, you might call it juvenile when you talk about the daycare kids, quite literally juvenile, but this guy really helps champion that cause in the clubhouse. Of the younger guys, he's still one of the older guys of the younger guys. And I know he hasn't been around forever, but he plays with that group of players, whether it's Bryson Stott, whether it's Alec Bohm, whoever it is, Johan Rojas, He's really there to like let them know that they have made an impact on this team. And I love that about him. That's a leadership quality that you love about Brandon Marsh when it comes to being one of the older, younger guys. Absolutely love his game. And I'd love to see him be in that conversation for an all-star, be in that conversation for a gold glover by the time the all-star votes start whipping up. And, of course, by the time the gold glove uh, conversation really uh, heats up in September. So, for me, I'd, I'd love to see that, and I think he's shown every bit of it. Alec Bohm. Last night, you have a situation where Christian Pache is on second base in the 10th inning. Um, to run through that inning for you, Phillies have a chance there to jump out to a one nothing series lead. Trey Turner starts things out, grounding out to third. You still have Pache on second. Still have the uh, open first base bag. Harper gets intentionally walked. Now, the last time this happened, JT Real Muto came up with the big swing in D.C. So the St. Louis Cardinals decide we're not going to be pitching to Bryce Harper in this situation. So they intentionally walk him. Alec Bohm steps up, and the very next pitch with a runner on first and second with one out, he puts down the left field line for an RBI double, gives you a 4-3 lead. Next batter, Bryson Stott steps up there. He gets a sack fly. He gets a pitch he can drive on the second pitch. Puts it in the center field. Harper scores from third. No problem. You're now up two runs. Nick Castellanos. Good God. 
I do not have a good feeling about Nick Castellanos this year. And it's, it, yes, it has a hell of a lot to do with a 154 average now. Is that what he's down to? <laughs> I, uh, no, excuse me, 113, I believe. Hold on. Let me, I'll, I'll get the official number for you. I don't want to be wrong on this. I don't want to make it seem lower than it is. Okay. Johan Rojas is at 154 now. I'm sorry. Nick Castellanos is at 114. Worst batting average on the team. For anyone not named Christian Pache. I have a huge concern about this because I, I just, I, I, I don't know what, I feel like this is going to be one of them years where we're happy if he hits 220. It, it goes beyond, oh, it's just an early season slump. I, I, I just don't have a good feeling about Nick Cassianos. He has looked more lost than Christian Pache has, in, or excuse me, more lost than uh, Johan Rojas was before last night. Continue to see him swing at, at pitches out of the zone consistently. It wasn't just last night. It wasn't just yet or two nights ago when it comes to the, the, the crazy expanded strike zone that Marquez had the last game in D.C. and uh, where uh, Carapazza had uh, last night. Um. I have major concerns about Nick Castellanos this season. I wish I could say it's oh, I, it's sometimes I watch guys in a slump and I go, all right, he's just about to break out. If you see the timing, we talked about with Bryce Harper before his three home run game. You see that timings there. He's just under a pitch here. He's just, you know, rolling over one there. He's, 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 he's swinging at a pitch outside the zone, whatever the case may be. Everything that Nick Cassianos is flailing at is a it's a flail. It's flailing. It's not like he is making a good decision on a swing. It seems like he is way late on everything. Timing is way off for him. Pitch recognition is unrecognizable to him. Completely lost. And yeah, of course, I I hope he breaks out of it. But what I'm watching is a guy that is far from breaking out of a slump anytime soon. And I'll hope today's the day he hits three home runs and all that, but he might be a guy that needs a day off. He might need. He might be a guy that needs to hit that reset button. The other thing with the Phils is it's not like they don't have a, a, a good amount of guys that can play in the outfield for you. I mean, Brandon Marsh hasn't really played over in, in right field by any means. Left field, center field is where you've seen him. But Whit Merrifield can go out there in left field. You, could, I have no doubt Brandon Marsh can go out there and play right field if you need him to in a pinch. Uh, you could obviously... Put Christian pa pa uh, Pache in left if you want. And move Brandon Marsh over to right. Uh, Pache in the corner outfield really, I think, loses a lot. But if they need to give Nick Castellanos a day off, it might not be the worst thing in the world to give him that day off today. Uh, you see him last night, 0 for 5, one strikeout. Uh, he joined Kyle Schwarber in that regard, being 0 for 5 on the evening. Not great. Not great. Again, if you needed Johan Rojas to bail you out, you got bigger problems. And you do. And one of them is named Nick Castellanos, unfortunately. Uh, I, I got to get back to this. I consider myself a non-practicing baseball purist. A non-practicing baseball traditionalist, if you will. I love the pitch clock. Love the runner on second. It's just what the game has evolved to in the 10th inning. You got to end these games faster with the way pitchers' arms are more valued and more taken care of than ever. You can't have these games. I love I loved the 17 inning game. I loved Wilson Valdez coming into pitch against the, uh, the, the Reds in that game. Okay. I, I loved Danny Baez having to pitch like three innings all of a sudden. And then his career was like over after that. But I, I love moments like that. Those, it's the way of the dodo, man. It's it's over. The why baseball can't embrace a better way to call balls and strikes is beyond me. <clears throat> and watching it last night, like there's no consistency. And the biggest case, this is what really drove me crazy last night. In the eighth inning, <clears throat> excuse me, Vic Carapaz is obviously the home plate umpire last night. Eighth inning, three two count to Donovan. Uh, he calls a pitch outside from Jose Alvarado. That pitch that he called outside had been a strike all night long. All right, we know what a strike is. We know what a ball is. We know what the strike zone is in baseball. Hell, they give you the nice little white box 
uh, on the broadcast now to tell you where the strike zone is, okay? But that's not the strike zone. That's what is by rule the strike zone. What the strike zone actually is, is what the umpire calls a strike and what the umpire calls a ball. And that was ever-changing <laughs> in last night's game. And like I said, it was pretty fat to begin with, and then it started to slow down. It's going to be slimmed down. So Carapazza uh, calls the 3-2 uh, uh, sinker from Alvarado uh, outside uh, when it had been a strike. And even during the broadcast, Ruben Amaro Jr. goes, oh, and Alvarado gets that, and he's a walk. It's a walk. It's a walk. He was fooled. We all were fooled because that had been a strike all night long. And now all of a sudden, it's a ball. So at this point in the game, it was 2-1. to one. Eighth inning. This is before Brandon Marsh hit the home run the ninth. Uh, and who do you have coming up now with a runner on first base and representing the go-ahead run? Paul Goldschmidt. Paul Goldschmidt, if you haven't followed his career, is, a, is pretty good at baseball. So now Jose Alvarado has to face Paul Goldschmidt. And I am on the edge of my seat going, don't you dare, don't you dare take him yard. Fortunately, he did not take him yard. Uh, he flies out to center field. But it just got me thinking about the balls and strikes in baseball again. And I know it was Manfred said, you know, within what maybe two years they're going to have the 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 robo umps. I'm all about robo umps calling balls and strikes and all that stuff. I, I I need to see that sooner rather than later, because if you're a hitter, you need to know what's a strike. If you're, it's look, I know it's been eternity in baseball forever. This is the way it's been done. It feels like in the last couple of seasons, it has been absolute bonkers what has been a strike and what hasn't been a strike. Uh, Kyle Schwarber going off on um, uh, was a um, Hernandez. Like to me, I I just need to see more of that. Laz Diaz having his issues, of course, behind the plate. I I I'm done with it. And I, I the reason I want to bring it up today is because the Phillies won. It's not just sour grapes. Oh, the Phillies lost. We were bitching about the umpire. No, no, no. They won last night. And the umpires still drove me crazy in last night's game. Vic Carapazza, come on. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, Zach Wheeler gets to start. So I'm all for robo I'm sooner than later. I'm all for a better way to do it. I even suspected him. The second half of last year, second half of last year, if you remember, I said this – like, something going on with the umpires where they were almost – they were almost perfect. And I'm like, they did something and they didn't tell anybody. I don't know if they have another umpire somewhere else – or somebody else that's like the traveling secretary for the umpires or something. I don't know. They have some other position where somebody's watching the game and they're on an IFB. <laughs> they're on a headset, essentially, in the ear of an umpire going, ball, strike, strike. And all the umpires just going like, heat, heat. Just making the calls on the field. And I thought about it. I'm like, that's actually not a bad way to do it. Because <laughs> it's right there. You just hit the ball. Strike. That's it. You still, look, even with the robo lumps, you're still going to have an ump behind the plate. Check swings. Foul tips. You got to listen for. Whether or not the ball hit the dirt. Plays at the plate, obviously. You still got to have an umpire at the plate. So you're not costing any, any jobs. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Zach Wheeler tonight. <laughs> Another 7.45 start time. Damn you, Midwest. Damn you. Still haven't made it out to St. Louis. In my travels with Sunday Night Football, I, I really wanted to do one Rams game. I wanted to do one Rams game when they were in St. Louis just because I had never been to St. Louis. I wanted to explore good old St. Louis. Never got the opportunity. Uh, tonight, here is what is at stake for your 76ers tonight. Okay. Uh, Milwaukee Bucks. This is the uh, standings that we're looking at right now for the people on the podcast. Here's what we're looking at. The uh, Milwaukee Bucks are... Uh, this is insane to me. The Milwaukee Bucks are in uh, second place in the uh, Eastern Conference. Doc Rivers squad, ladies and gentlemen, has lost seven, seven games of their last ten. Seven games of their last 10. That's not great. 
but it certainly helps the 76ers in some weird way uh, because it makes me uh, want to face the Bucs even more. Now, here's where we're at for the 76ers. 76ers are a game behind the Indiana Pacers. They're a half game up on the Miami Heat. Tonight is a big night in the NBA for your 10 9 8 76ers. The reason is because the Pistons are in town for the first game of a three-game homestand here for the Sixers to round out the rest of their regular season. Now, while the Sixers are going to be taking on the Pistons, you look around the rest of the NBA, the guys on this list, the teams on this list that are going to be in action uh, two nights on this Tuesday, Sixers and Pistons at 7 o'clock, Pacers at Raptors at 7 o'clock, Miami at Atlanta at 7.30. Basically, the teams that you're really concerned with are all in action tonight. The Pacers have won two in a row. Only two teams in the Eastern Conference of any relevance have won uh, five games in a row. And that's the Boston Celtics, and that's the Philadelphia 76ers. That is who is looking pretty damn good at this point in the season. That's it. Joel Embiid will obviously be playing every one of these games from here on out as the season goes on, as you don't have any back-to-backs for the rest of the season. And you obviously don't have any back-to-backs in the playoffs. I would love to see the Sixers get out of that seven seed. I'd love for the Sixers. Like, here's the deal. I, bottom line is, I want the Sixers to get out of the play-in tournament. I know that it could be a, another game or two for Joel Embiid to help his cause and uh, you know get back into game shape and all that. Um, I'll take my chances <laughs> without the Sixers. Uh, hopefully, maybe drawing the the um, the Magic. Uh, I'd rather that happen than than anything else. So just keep on winning, keep on winning. Now, as the season goes on, we got an update on DeAnthony Melton. You could be getting him back soon, which would be fantastic. Uh, the more help you get, the more bench help you get is fantastic. Um, but I think the Sixers are, are pretty set. And one of the things I have really enjoyed about the last, let's say, two, three weeks of the 76ers season has been the play of Kelly Oubre. Tobias Harris has continued. I know he's injured, but Tobias Harris has just disappointed. Let's just put it as plainly and simply and kindly as possible. Every single time the Sixers get a new player, and maybe this is just a mental block for him where he just doesn't know his role or whatever. I don't know. I don't want to make excuses for him, but. Let's just, we know what he is, which is, he's not, he's not anywhere near the guy. He is a fourth guy at best. Okay. What Kelly Oubre has done for this team um, in the month of April, uh, the end of March is exactly what this team needed. It's somebody to step up and take over scoring responsibility. It's someone to step up. And even on nights where he doesn't light up the scorecard or, or light up the box score, he comes up with a surge to put things and put momentum back in the Sixers' favor. He certainly did this and helped out tremendously. I mean, it was the Tyrese Maxey show two nights ago against the Spurs, but Kelly Oubre certainly got his. And you have seen him continuously throughout the season look a hell of a lot more uh, like a guy, more than just a guy who's scoring 15 points per game. Like, if you look at his season numbers, it's like, oh, okay, he's a decent player. But recently, you put, you look at the numbers that he's had, let's say, over the last five games. 26 against the San Antonio Spurs. 17 against, against the Grizzlies. 18 against the Heat. And those 18 points, again, that you know, nothing eye-popping about those points. But you look at the run that he had at the end of the third quarter. You look at the run that he had at the beginning of the fourth quarter. The Sixers needed that swing from somebody. They needed a fire lit from somebody to help him win that game. Kelly Oubre was that guy. Oklahoma City, again, 25 points comes up big for the Sixers there. The game in Toronto where they just shot the lights out. Kelly Oubre is one of the big contributors in that game with 32 points. Like this is this is a guy that's not just lighting up the box score, knocking down shots left and right. It's the moments in the game where you feel that swing coming, where whether it's the Heat just taking control or it's the Raptors trying to inch their way back into a basketball game. 
or it's uh, San Antonio trying to take control. There's a baseline drive from Kelly Oubre, slam dunk, the flex. There's a, a steal and a layup. The steal on one end goes coast to coast over Jimmy Butler in the heat game for an easy two. And then the flex again. There's little things like that that Kelly Oubre has provided. That it's supposed to be like a Tobias Harris role. And it's just never really come. It's never been that. The Sixers needed Kelly Oubre. And looking back on the offseason, I was excited that they got Kelly Oubre. I was happy they got Kelly Oubre. But with Daryl Morey making the addition, I didn't realize that they were really getting a guy that was going to be the number three on this team. And yes, Tyrese Maxey has stolen all the headlines, as rightfully so, being his first All Star season, and how, how great that is, how much fun that's been. But Ubre coming into the Sixers locker room and getting into the starting five, cracking into that starting five, has been a sight for sore eyes. And this feels like to me through the Ben Simmons year, where it was Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons, uh, whether it was James Harden and Joel Embiid. This version of the Sixers feels like the best since Jimmy Butler was here. And I've talked about it many times before, man. I, I don't want to have to tell my grandkids one day when they ask me about the process, what was this process? You know, I don't want to have to tell them that the 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 one card in the house of cards that made it all tumble down was Jimmy Butler. I don't want that to be the case. The Sixers decided to sign Tobias Harris. They decided not to sign Jimmy Butler. They decided to keep Brett Brown. They decided to keep Ben Simmons and not keep Jimmy Butler. Like, think of all the things that could have gone right. Like, I, that's one of the things that's it's a very complicated situation. But still, if Jimmy Butler was still here and it was Jimmy Butler and Joel Embiid, would the Sixers have had a championship by now? Um, the Sixers have been trying to get back to that level. And I feel like in the post-process trying to win moments with the Sixers, I feel like that was by far the best team they had. Even Far, far better than James Harden and all that. Far better than the team that got bounced out in seven games to the uh, Atlanta Hawks. Certainly better than that team. But this basketball team, with Joel Embiid playing at the level that he's been able to play at, and when he ramps up his minutes and gets back to 30, 35 minutes, Tyrese Maxey playing at the level that he's been at, and Kelly Oubre as that number three guy. Man, you get Buddy Heald shooting. You get contributions from K.J. Martin, of all people. Like This shows you that different guys can step up at different times. Also, Kyle Lowry playing the way he's played. This is the best version of Sixers basketball we could see in the playoffs since that Jimmy Butler team. And I really don't want to go back on that team and think about what could have been if Jimmy Butler would have stayed. But this, this basketball team that I'm watching right now, with Joel Embiid on the floor, Kelly Oubre playing at the level he's playing at, and obviously Tyrese Maxey just being, uh, as of late, the reincarnation of Allen Iverson, yeah, this is pretty damn good. I'm very curious to see how this team goes. It's funny. Because I have, because I have such low expectations of the 76ers, I almost expect them to do more. I realize how convoluted that statement is. But I was thinking about, I was like, wow, you know, with this team playing at the level that they're playing at with Tyrese Maxey and, and Kelly Oubre and obviously Joel Embiid and all that, I feel like I'm not, my expectations aren't that high for this team. Like, I, like they, they, they shouldn't make it to the Eastern Conference Finals. But because I don't have the high expectations as I did before when they were the number one seed, number two seed, or number three seed, I'm like, oh, maybe this is the year where they'll actually do something because I'm not expecting much. But without expecting much, I'm expecting everything. That's I, I feel like that convoluted statement is the best way to sum up being a Sixers fan as of late. But it, it, it's gotten honest truth. I was like, wow, so they really shouldn't do anything. But I'm like, well, wait a minute. Now that, now that I don't have that expectation, they should do everything. And it's like, and scene. The life of a Sixers fan. <laughs> Coming to a theater near you. Anyway. I know that doesn't make any sense, but that's exactly how it's the best way I can sum up being a Sixers fan. I don't expect anything from them, which is why I expect them to do something. It's, it's hellish is what it is. Let me tell you about my bookie, ladies and gentlemen, mybookie.ag. Download my bookie to your phone. Have yourself a good old time. My bookie, mybookie.ag. Want to bet on the world of basketball? Want to bet on the Sixers? 
uh, taking on the action tonight uh, with the, the Detroit Pistons. What is the line on that game? Uh, you can do it tonight. With my bookie, mybookie.ag. Uh, you can bet on the world of basketball. You can bet on the world of baseball. Bet on the world of just about anything, uh, when, including television. You can bet on television. That's right. You can also bet on the world of politics. How much fun is that? Uh, do that at my bookie, mybookie.ag. Download the app. Use promo code Farsi and get up to $1,000 redeemable cash bonus at my bookie, mybookie.ag. Sixers uh, favored by 15 and a half points. Tonight. So that's what you can look at. Sixers taking on the business, of course. Uh, so yeah, that's what you got going on with my bookie, mybookie.ag. How about the game time app? Download the game time app to your phone. Use promo code Farzy. Get twenty dollars off your first purchase at at uh, the game time app. Take advantage of all the game time app and what they have to offer tonight. Uh, want to go? Want to go to game? Last three home games, 76ers for the season. Last three games of the season, you can get the tickets on the game time app. It takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. You could view your seat's vantage point from your phone before you buy the tickets. And how about the game time guarantee, where if you find tickets in the same section or row for less money elsewhere on some other site, some other app, the game time app will get you back at 110% of the difference. That's a game time guarantee. So download game time app to your phone. Use promo code FARS and get $20 off your first purchase on the game time app. How about PHL Sports Station, Philadelphia Sports Station, enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience across all social media and blogs. That's phlsportsnation.com. Let's get into the chat check and see how you wonderful people are doing on this fine Tuesday morning. Oh, man. Chat is bumping today, baby. Uh, I miss the days when pitchers went eight innings and the closer came in in the ninth. Maverick won. I miss those days, too. Daz, good morning. Get a closer. Okay, so after the game, um, after the game, Daz, part of Rob Thompson's uh, – by the way, can we just take a second? Does anybody else find the post-game press conference in baseball for the away manager hilarious? I I don't know why I find it so funny, but it's hilarious to me. He's just sitting at his desk. That's it. He's just sitting at his desk, and then the reporters come in and start asking him questions. It's just really weird to me. Like, you don't have a, a press conference room. You don't have... Even the the hallway with the backdrop, like the bare minimum is the hallway interview with the backdrop that says Phillies or NBC Sports Philly or something like that. That's the weirdest thing to me that he just sits at his desk and answers questions. Rob Thompson sitting at his desk answering questions. I uh, was asked about uh, the, 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 the Alvarado coming into in the eighth inning. They had the top of the order up there. He wanted to get through their top of the order with Jose Alvarado. They got through the top of the order with Jose Alvarado. Jeff Hoffman came in and then faced, you know. Not the top of the order, and then still got hit around a little bit. So, not great. Not great. Uh, buddy Christ, good morning. But, uh, Des, to answer your question, I think Alvarado is their closer. Rob Thompson just opted to not have him close. Tinker Topper. Tinker Topper. Twiz, what's popping? Daz, Twiz, I, sl- I seriously have no clue how to watch Dan. I actually tried tuning in yesterday. Uh Oh, (laughs) all right. Uh... (laughs) Get a legit closer, says Daz. We've only been asking for 10 years. Get after it. Maverick one, pitchers are wimps in today's Major League Baseball. Yeah, they're definitely babied. April. Good morning, April. Uh, Let's focus on this for a second. Um... Yeah, I, you know, Zach Wheeler is a guy that will argue. Zach Wheeler is a guy that will tell Rob Thompson, Joe Girardi, whoever, no, I'm not out. What are you, I'm not done. What, I'll, I'll let you know. I'll let you know when I'm done. But that's just the way, that's few and far between. And that's just the way it is nowadays. And if I could change anything in Major League Baseball, but just in terms of approach to the game, it would be the way starting pitchers are used. And now I, I, I understand that there, there people are terrified of injury and all that. I, I just, I don't understand what happened. Like, are scientists studying this? People that are like are still studying evolution, okay? Are they are they looking at, oh, have we, have we seen what's happened to right-handed and left-handed throwers? 
that throw things at a high rate of speed? Have we looked at major league pitchers and this flawed evolution that's happened in the last 20 years? How did we go from uh, complete games galore in baseball to like zero? How did that happen? How did that happen? What what break in evolution happened in an in the arm that said, "Oh well, God, you got to these guys go f- more than five innings." Are you crazy? I, I I'm dumbfounded by it. I watched that Nolan Ryan documentary, Daz. Yeah, Daz uh, uh, says that Nolan Ryan would pitch uh, three hundred innings. Yeah, I watched that Nolan Ryan documentary, and I'm watching him work out. And first off, when his granddaughter impersonated him. And said, Hi, I'm Nolan Ryan for Advil. I <laughs> said that was one of the funniest things. And, and Nolan Ryan was even cracking up watching it. Um, facing Facing Nolan, I believe, is the name of the, the, the documentary. It was on Netflix. I don't know if it still is, but I watched it. It was fantastic. It was awesome. Um, but yeah, I'm watching this guy work out, and I'm like, why not just copy and paste? If you're a pitcher, just do what this guy's doing. He's 90 years old. And he's curling 90-pound dumbbells. Just do what, just do what he's doing. You don't make them like Texas leaguers anymore. Um, oh, man. Steve Carlton pitching in the extra innings. I remember being a kid and watching. Um, oh, God. I'm going to blank on his name. Jack uh, for the Twins. Uh, uh, pitching 10 innings in a World Series game? What the? <laughs> That's insane. Maverick won. Doc Holliday refused to uh, refuse to leave games. Yep. Fuji, good morning. Detroit had high hopes for Spencer Turnbull. He's looking damn good right now. Uh, Dave Dabrowski drafted him in Detroit. And then the same Detroit scout that is now with the Phillies. Uh, he mentioned his name last night. I can't remember his name, but Rob Thompson mentioned him. Said they, that they scouted Spencer Turnbull before they drafted him with the with the Tigers, and then um, they went and scouted him again before the season and said, "Oh yeah, he's back," and they went and signed him. Daz, love that dude, Brandon Marsh. How do you not? How do you not? Uh, Twiz, if they kept that same energy with Josh Allen, it would make sense, but it doesn't, huh? What happened? What did I miss here? Uh, <laughs> Sean Kilray, Nikki Three Buttons needs to have a day off like Pache. Uh, let Pache play. I'd be for it. I, I just say that I just Christian Pache. It's a weird thing. I don't in the in the corner outfield spots. I feel like Christian Pache just isn't very comfortable. But if it means giving Nick Cassiano's day off, <laughs> let it happen immediately. I slam Hurts as well when he plays bad, but three years straight of flat out hate drives me. I, I, man, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what to tell you, Daz. I can only tell you about my opinions. Oh yeah, Deshaun Cooper Deshaun had a great uh, pro day yesterday. Hell's yeah. Uh, saw the defensive stock way up. Yeah, who was it? Shefty that put out all the numbers. It was pretty spectacular. Um, Cooper DeJean yesterday. Uh, yeah, here it is. Yeah, big day for Cooper DeJean. Uh, a better 40 time than Trent McDuffie. Uh, Cooper DeJean's 40 time was 4-4-3, beating the 4-4-4 from uh, Trent Duffy. Same vertical as Steve Smith, 38 and a half. Uh, same broad jump as Jalen Johnson, ten uh, four, and bench. Oh, he did do bench reps as his pro day. Sixteen, more than Antrell Roll. Fifteen, not bad, not bad. He can definitely bench the bar. Uh, but yeah, he hit himself a day. I love the Dijon too. Nice job. Don't think I didn't notice that. Uh, still going to trade back at Cooper. It's hard to tell because. Uh, Mike Fuji, April baseball. I think big stick will come around. I don't know, man. 
I, 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 uh, I, I don't have a good vibe. There's something I'm sensing about Nick Cassianos. Uh, even if he happens to accidentally put a barrel on one, I just go, all right, well, it'll be few and far between. I am having the feeling of 2022 Nick Castellanos and certainly not 2023 Nick Castellanos. Maverick going, pitch clock sucks. I like it. <laughs> That's all I got for you. I, look, the, the game, this is the this is what the game has evolved to. Um, I wish that this it wasn't what the game evolved to, but everyone's just taking their sweet-ass time nowadays. And that used to be a great thing in baseball. But that also was when a um, a game stopped being four hours, or games weren't four hours long. You needed to do something to uh, expedite the process a little bit. What was what was last night? It's a ten inning, a ten inning, a ten inning game last night was two hours and fifty minutes. Ten, two hours and fifty minutes, two and a half hours without extra innings is beautiful. It's perfect. Three and a half. I, just watching these games drag on constantly on the East Coast past 10 o'clock was just like, come on. Oh, Tug said, you got to believe. You got to believe. Absolutely. Maverick, <laughs> runner on second sucks. <laughs> I'm a fan of it all. I'm a fan of it all. Robo umpires incoming. Hell yeah, man. Let's go. Runner on second is just terrible. Oh, you guys. You guys. Embrace it, baby. Embrace it. This is what baseball needed. Uh, April, as long as Angel Hernandez is still calling at the plate, you know they don't care about getting it right. It Here's what frustrates me so much about baseball, though, with, with, with that, is that you literally see that it's a strike. You literally strike. You see it in the strike zone. Ball. <laughs> like, imagine anything else. That's another thought that crept into my mind last night. Imagine any other call in sports being that blatantly wrong, and you know it immediately. Like, imagine that. Like, Football, they at least have the presence of mind to review scoring and turnovers. It's right, we're just going to review it. We're just going to review it. Like, don't even have to challenge it. Turnover, score, we're going to review it. Imagine they didn't do that. Remember when they didn't do that? That, was, that wasn't that great. Being denied touchdowns, even though you had broke the plane. The other team fumbling, having not been down by contact. Are you sure about that? I'm seeing the replay right now. It says, it says. They've, they've made that adjustment. Now, I understand that scoring and turnovers in football are not nearly as um, regular as, you know, a, a pitch in baseball. But imagine seeing a call and anything else that you knew immediately was blatantly wrong, and uh, that's it. I remember I, I triggered somebody, I think it was a couple of years, two years ago, three years ago. I, I think all the tweet, the only tweet I put out was something along the lines of like, uh, baseball, see a ball. Call a strike, stays a ball, baseball. Like you see it immediately. The reason they how they haven't incorporated this technology sooner is beyond me. Uh... <laughs> Put a lawn chair there. Yeah, twist says yeah. Yeah, make it a wiffle ball. Make it a wiffle ball. If you hit, the, regardless of where it crosses the plate, if it hits the, if it hits the lawn chair, it's a strike, baby. Protect that lawn chair. Goldschmidt last night was insane. The play he made on Bohm. Was that after the Harper play? By the way, no follow-up. I, I found that interesting. I didn't, I didn't hear or see any follow-up about Bryce Harper. Uh, but he was slow going down the first base in, the, in that eighth inning. Let me see here. Yeah, it was double play. Uh, Turner led off with an infield single, beat out the, the, the throw from short win great play by him but just couldn't get turner at first turner just barely beats it out and then harper steps up grounds it into four six three double play but put the ball deep in the hole between second and first and that's a play that you're used to seeing bryce harper did. if he sees the ball go in that hole he just like, boom he just takes off down the first base back tries to beat out that play and could have beaten the play out for whatever reason 
he was really slow going down the first base bag. Very slow going down to the first base bag. Uh, they were questioning on the broadcast. I was questioning going, is he okay? I haven't seen anything about Bryce Harper after the game, so I'm assuming he's fine. But right after that, Alec Bohm uh, put one back to uh, Libertore, who fielded it. I think he fielded Yeah. Who was it, the catcher? Um, yeah. Through to Goldschmidt, and Goldschmidt was lunging into foul territory to make the catch and keep his foot on the bag to get Bohm, holding Bohm from what, well, what could have been a double, well, not a double, it would have been a throwing error, but keeping Bohm at, uh, at worst on first base. Um, but if he doesn't make that play, Bohm's standing on second. And yeah, Paul Goldschmidt, pretty great at baseball all around. Yeah, uh, win at shortstop is nice. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> they do robo ups. I'll never watch again. Yes, you will. You liar. Like I, maybe robo ups is the wrong thing to refer to it, but that's how a lot of people refer to it. And that's just what's in my head. It's not like they're just gonna have a robot behind the behind the plate. They still have an umpire. Okay. At worst, be able to appeal it. At worst, be able to appeal the strike zone. I, I think in one minor league or one independent league, they they're, they're they're testing it where the way to appeal it is the batter just like taps his head. And the umpire looks, turns around at the score at the uh, the the media, the score, the media area, whatever, and uh, they just go, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, like you were right, you were wrong. We're like, oh, okay, that was a strike, I was wrong. <laughs> Miss Cousy, everybody. All right, and we resume. Joe Matty, what's going on? Mark, everyone, hello. Me, I said, Chad. Me, I, what's going on? Me, hi. Me, I. Sixers could still somehow be the number two seed. Left out loud, Doc Rivers. Sixers getting back. I was looking at hold on a second. How tightly wrapped is it? I mean, I'm sorry, I know I kept this up for a while, but uh no, I don't think they can get the two seed. Yeah, no, they can't get the two seed. Um, they could get the third seed. But uh yeah. Uh Glenn Rue Sixers are back to being better than the Flyers. <laughs> wow. Oh, what an unfortunate end to that season. Uh, ooh. Oh, no, come on. Jack Morris. Thank you. Thank you, Sean Kilroy. Jack Morris is the pitcher for the Twins. Damn it. Where I just, oh, man, it was a great. It was a great comment. Um, ah, come on. Oh, yes. This is what I was looking at. I was looking for. What's worse, the process or the dream team? The process. The process is worse. If they end the same way with neither winning a championship. Like the, the dream team, at least that was just one year and you were done. And you're like, okay, that was horrible. Uh, the process, you forfeited three years of fandom. Like, you forfeited three years. Of, like, I'm going to accept that this team is going to be god-awful for three years, and then after that, hopefully, they start winning some basketball games. That was a three-year thing, man. That sucks. Yeah, Jim Dorsey, I saw this. This was this is incredible. The number one team in the NBA win percentage Joel Embiid and, and Tyrese Maxey. When they're on the court together with the Sixers, they win 79% of their games best in the NBA. That's pretty fantastic. Uh, Castellano's son might hit better sooner rather than later. Possibly, r, &R possibly. Beat Denver, Boston, OKC, Wolves, Lakers, all top-seeded teams. Yep. Twist analytics taking over sports, yeah. Joe Nathan, huh? Jim Dorman. Yeah, this is where I said thank you guys. All over Jack Morris. Thank you. If for the kids that don't know this, go, yeah, go YouTube uh, after the show, right before you watch Birds 365 with our friends John McMullen and Jody McDonald. Uh in the in between, YouTube. Nolan Ryan, Robin Ventura. That was 1990. Why do I remember being older? I don't know. Um Let's see. Uh, hey, James Alexander. Nice to see you. Welcome to the party, pal. 
Like a hold. Oh yeah, like a hold in the Super Bowl. Wah, wah. 28 best corner number. Six seed is better. I concur. Unreal stat, Devin. Oh, God. Oh, oh. Why are you even putting this out there, Twiz? Okafor Simmons and Yippee Fultz. Nolan Ryan, Randy Johnson, two favorite pitchers. Those guys are terrifying. Randy Johnson, even more terrifying. If you were a bird. Another thing to YouTube later. Randy Johnson, bird. You're welcome. Uh, to all the kids out there. Let's get to the morning rush. Brought to you by Sky Motor Cars, SkyMotorCars.com. Thanks to everybody in the chat. You guys are wonderful as per usual. Here's what you got. The uh, 76ers back at it tonight, 7 o'clock. Keep the winning coming, boys. Go for six in a row tonight. As for your Philadelphia Flyers, uh, they're in Montreal. Third straight road game. Seven losses in a row. Uh, not great, Bob. Uh, seven o'clock puck drop in Montreal. Uh, the uh, national championship went down last night in college basketball. Got to mention that. UConn. As dominant as dominant can be over the last two years, uh, they took care of uh, Purdue yesterday, last night, 75 to 60. Hey, just to be an old man one more time to yell at a cloud, uh, just the way I was about you know all that. Well, I guess it's not an old man thing to want robo umps, but anyway, um, 9.20 start time? 9.20 start time. Is there any league killing it more right now than, than the NFL? No? Okay. Has it been like that for a long time? Yeah? Okay. Did it maybe take a page out of the NFL's book? If the NFL is going to have their championship game around, you know, 6, 6.30, 6.30, then maybe all other championship games should be, I don't know, 6, 6.30, 7 at the latest? And, oh, yeah, I definitely have it on a Sunday. Or a Saturday, even, you know? Uh, that's just a possibility. That's just a possibility. It's all I'm trying to say. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Hey, uh, tonight I'll be on the Locked On Sports Network, the Locked On Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel. Subscribe right now. Uh, and I'll be carrying you guys for Sixers postcast. So I'll be doing the post game show uh, after the 76ers. Hopefully take care of business. Do take care of business against the Detroit Pistons tonight. Uh, so make sure you guys hit like, subscribe right here on the Farsi Show YouTube channel, Jacob Media YouTube channel, as well as Locked On Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel as well. My name is Mark Farzetta. This is the Farsi Show presented by MyBookie, mybookie.ag. Thanks for being along for the ride. We'll be back with you guys tonight on the Locked On Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel. And I'll be back with you guys uh, tomorrow morning as per usual. See you guys then, everybody. Bye.